awesome evening uh, to have an opportunity to go ahead and do another one of our reviews. I still think we're going to do one on Friday, hopefully at 1 o'clock. I want to try to make that our time to do reviews. That's going to change. Like I said, a lot of my Patreons over there, like I said, my Patreons, I consider my boss, so I listen to them heavily on when to schedule things. Um, and, you know, doing them at 1 o'clock lets a lot of you European folks have an opportunity to actually get in on a live stream. Uh, if I do them a little bit later, I, it may be a rotating schedule. I don't know. Uh, the one big thing that's been going on, though, is that when I tried to do the schedule, it just sucked. Um, you know, I am, you know, I've got that kind of artist brain thing going on. And when I'm kind of feeling the, the mood, um, I am able to, you know, get out there and produce. And, it, you know, and when I've got the stuff, I want to release it and I think that's what we're going to go with. But like I said, that's a, that's a topic for a different conversation. Uh, getting started, I have an excellent show for you guys this evening. Uh, we have a film actually suggested by one of our viewers, uh, Le Fabrication des Canons de Math. I think that's how the French say it. Oui, oui. Uh, it is a, a, clearly a French film about making Damascus barrels. Uh, this would have been, judging from the, the quality of the video, most likely just after the turn of the century. And this is how they made a lot of the Damascus shotgun barrels from back in the day. It was a very popular thing. A lot of the shotguns, even here in the U.S., were a Damascus barrel. Uh, they went out of fashion because at that point, these shotguns used black powder. Um, and... What happened is that very quickly people moved to a different type of gunpowder known as nitrocellulose. And the nitrocellulose was much more powerful than the black powder. And so what happened, if you put a new nitrocellulose shell into one of these old barrel, these old guns, the barrel could and did explode from back in the day. So, yeah, one of them things. One of them things. All right. So, uh, if you guys don't know what happens, we're going to switch over to our cool-ass video review screen. There we go. And we're going to work this just like we did last time. Uh, I'll be talking about the video. I have not watched this. Uh, I haven't gone through yet to check any of that stuff out. So, uh, there's not... Actually, like I, I speak a little bit of French, but the problem is is there this video is so old, there is no audio. So... Uh, it should be audio on there. Maybe <laughs> is Dane having an issue? <laughs> How do I get this audio? People are speaking of everybody else has got audio. Dane, <laughs> I think Dane's having problems. Uh, unless something just happened, everybody see me? Everybody hear me? Except for Dane, who's special. <laughs> We're still good there. Looks like we're good. Still broadcasting, still connected, still transmitting, I think. Yes, no. United him, Dane. <laughs> anyway, all right. So we're going to go from there. So we're going to get uh, <laughs> 50p in the electricity meter. <laughs> all right. So let's, uh, let's get rocking on here. Okay. See, there seems to be like some super, um, some super latency as well. We're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and, and go. I, I thought I had started, I'd set these things to like the right latency, but I don't know. Let's get cracking. Uh, like I said, there are some translations. Um, Provence, 1925, 1931. So one thing that's, this is kind of weird. I just have to point this out because of where I'm from. Uh, down here, we never have these rivers that run beside buildings because if there's ever any like water anywhere, it means it's swamp. And so one of the weirdest things I ever look at when I watch other videos, especially from Europe, that you actually have roads that run beside rivers. Here, we do not have roads that run beside rivers. They all cross parallel or, or excuse me, perpendicular uh, because there's all swampland. So to see like a river beside a building is like super cool for me. Just a little geographical thing I had to point out. So again, only thing we have on here is like really weird. 
weird like classical music and it, the whole thing's just dubbed with music so I, I don't think there was any original audio here but one of the wild things is you wonder when that building itself was was built I think there's uh, several laws in France that when you build a new house, I think you has to stand, it has to be built to spec to stand for, I think, three or four hundred years. It may be, you know, it's pretty wild. Again, we don't have any buildings like this in the U.S., or at least we have very, very few of them. Uh, everything we have here is, is wooden and stick built. All right, so building's cool. Let's get to some action. This video is not terribly long. It's about 23 minutes. Well, there's somebody. Oh, there we are. Hello. Whatever you do, don't greet these men in German. <laughs> you know, again, this is 1925, somewhere around in there. And look how old this building is to start with. Yes, yes, the French. Now, now, wait a minute. Check this out. Now, that's weird. Are they are they actually wearing clogs? Like, I didn't re realize that the French wore clogs. <laughs> and yes, if you have a a French gun maker, his name is Le Pew Pew. <laughs> that's just terrible. <laughs> But look how damn dark it is in there. I mean, in comparison. I mean, good Lord. Now, it's like the camera. They have no idea who this camera guy is. <laughs> Just sit there and stare. These men are like the most uncomfortable. Oh, God. Well, we figured out where Rasputin went. <laughs> All right. I was about to say, I was about to have to translate this. Masses of iron, which would be a billet, laminated or transformed into fine baguettes. I had no idea that baguettes translated into pattern. Now, the other thing is, is look at the pattern that they, they're, they're laminating up here. You know, today, even when you've got knives and things like that, you know, we think of simple patterns. You know, it, by 1925, I mean, they were, these were, you know, incredibly fine, fine patterns. And if you've never seen, um, if you've ever ne have never actually seen the Damascus gun barrels, the pattern is very fine and the welds are very good as well. So, you know, this is really kind of a height of forge welding technology. You know, the other thing that I, I realized that, you know, even in the star of the film or the title of the film is, is Damas, uh, Canon's Damas La Fabrication. Um, so th the fact is, is they are calling this Damascus where it's, whereas we know it is pattern welded steel. You know, I remember when the whole knife making thing got up and everybody was to kind of the effect of, um, you know, wait, is that, hang on a second. Let me stop right there. So everything was the fact that, you know, it wasn't Damascus. Damascus was what we know as watered steel or woot steel, um, and, you know, Alfred Pendray did a lot of the research into understanding how that crucible steel was made. Um, but apparently the misnomer uh, actually went all the way back, you know, to 1925, where even the French gun makers are referring to what is pattern welded steel as Damascus steel. And the crazy thing is, is there, you know, if, if the translation is correct, they say that they're actually examining the billets here and if that's the billet then these are super super tiny billets if the drawings previously are those that means that these are super tiny pieces that they're starting with you know the camera said yeah just just look at these
All right, so guys, first of all, how much neat stuff is going on right here? So this is one of the things that we run into or I run into a lot as a Smith when you go to like an antique store because if I had seen this thing, that this, this actual water trough with this arm and a hand crank, I most likely would have assumed that it was missing some piece to the machine in the middle. So this is a custom built twisting jig. And what's happening here is they've put this thing in the fire and they want to make a very tight twist. And what's going to happen though, if you've got a bar that's really long and there's heat all around it, it may start to twist evenly, but because as it tightens up, it cools, it's going to twist at a different rate. So what's happening is the older guy here, uh, is actually using differential cooling, just like when we make a rat tail on an S hook. You know, you make the curl, but you then you need to make the hook. And if you were to hammer on the rat tail when it's hot, it's going to deform it. You cool it, and everything's there. So what he's doing is he's using this jug of water to cool the metal and slow the rate of twist. So most likely wherever it's twisting and it twists tight, he sees what he likes. As soon as it gets to the tightness of twist that he wants. He drops water on it, and then that twist will transfer to softer metal, if that makes sense. And they're just going to walk it all the way up the bar. But again, this twisting jig is pretty, pretty damn amazing. So if one place is twisting too fast or one place is not twisting fast enough, he can control that with the application of water. Of course, as it twists, it's going to want to buckle a little bit. Now, notice the anvil here. Now, this is something that here in the U.S., we just don't, we don't have a lot of, uh, when everybody, when everybody, um, when everybody thinks of an anvil in the U S we think of the London pattern, you know, the, you know, the classic Peter Wright or things of this nature. But the fact is, is that almost every industry had specialized anvils. It's just that again, in our, especially in our country, we don't have, um, you know, we just never had them. So this is, looks like a weird anvil. The other thing that I would point out is look at the cross peen hammer. Now this is this is known as a French pattern. French pattern hammers tended to actually have the little chink there at the bottom. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as a lock maker's hammer. But one of the other things I want you to notice is look right here on the end. Look at how this piece is mushroomed. That means that most likely, and there's there's not a lot of of, of splaying. There's not a lot of breakage there. So there's a good chance that this whole hammer is actually straight wrought iron. Um, the other thing I would have you notice, look how hinky the handle is. You know, this wasn't something that they put on a shaving horse and drew out and made pretty. I mean, it looks like somebody hacked this thing out with, a, with an ax and crammed it in there and went back to work. Um, you know, that's one of the other things that I always, you know, in the shop, we always try to, we, we always try to make nice looking tools and nice looking tongs and straight looking tongs. But when you go back and you see these videos and you look back into history, their tools kind of look like crap. Even the Viking Mastomir find where there was a chest of blacksmith's tools, his tongs were terrible looking. Um, so it's just odd to see these. Also look right over here. You can actually see a hot cut. All right, let's keep rocking. So now they've twisted these very, these very thin rods together. 
And the issue is, is these things are round. I wonder if they're actually going to twist all of those together like a cable and then forge weld or, or if they're going to try to forge weld it all straight. So they're actually welding them side by side. So they've actually stacked this billet. They're not, there's the cut, there's the cutting hardy. Notice they're cutting off over the edge of the anvil. Now look real quick, you can barely see it, but look how fine their coal is. So what they, they, they've just stacked looks like three rods side by side and they are making a rectangular billet just working it all the way, all the way down. Those rods can't, they can't be more than three eighths of an inch thick. Now, real quick, a couple of things. Notice the bevel that's on top of the anvil here. You know, many times these things had very specific uses, and I wonder why there is such a heavy bevel right through here. Let me show you something else. You notice where these guys are working. And one, one detail you may not have noticed, look down the side of the anvil right here. Look at where, after all the time, the slag has basically been coming off and actually gluing to the anvil. But you think how long they've been doing that, <laughs> that there's slag build up on the side of the anvil. Now there's a cool tool. All right, so this is basically a measuring stick. Instead of having to put a tape on there, um, those particular, those little grooves are particular sizes. So you can just very quickly see, you know, it's like almost like a go, no go gauge that, you know, if you're looking to have it under a certain thickness, you just stick it on there. You don't have to read anything. Look at the hammer over here. Again, look what a raggedy, look, a raggedy ass looking hammer. And again, notice the swelling in the front. So there's a good chance all of this is in fact wrought iron, maybe not even steel faced. And the other thing that you notice is at no point we see them fluxing the metal. Now that may or may not have been on camera off, but I haven't seen any fluxing there. So, you know, they may, they may be using straight rot. Rot doesn't require flux. And they talked about, you see the tight twist right there. And then there's the actual, what they call the ribbon. And again, these are professional smiths. And I, you know, one of the things that I always kind of, um, 
I, I always kind of chide myself over it. We really do make kind of do a best practices thing. You know, when people, when I'm looking at blacksmithing for beginners and things like that, you know, I'm really trying to give people good practice. Now, everybody is just making do for the most part. You know, and I, I say, you know, well, that's fine. If you're getting started, make do. But as you get better about it, do things better. And then when we go back, and, and, I, and this, this is not lost on me, when we go back and we start watching these videos about these professionals, look at his apron and look what the hell it's tied with. It's like it's tied with sisal cord. I mean, this is about as half-assed as it gets. And these guys... I mean, and these guys are the professionals. So, you know, it's almost kind of arrogant of us as as modern day guys to say, hey, you know, you got to have the nice, neat stuff. None of them seem to have had good looking stuff at all, like at all. Shrink myself just a little bit. Stand out here, boys, and look at this. <laughs> That, that guy looks like a serial killer. He is like pissed. Now let me look at my stick. <laughs> These damn directors. <laughs> this is where actors learn to hate directors. <laughs> All right. So that's a new one on me. I mean, I knew that they were made around mandrels, but apparently there is a fine strip of tin formed to the mandrel. I see I have no idea what's going on here. I've never seen this process. All right, now that's a cool little deal. All right, whoa, 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 whoa okay. We got to, all right. What? All right, so now this is the thing where, again, and I stress there's so many tools you would have no idea what they were for unless you saw them work because if you saw all these pieces laying on the floor I would have never I would have never put what this is for so that groove is not it is not going to be any type of swage it is a groove for holding the mandrel and so two things this guy right here acts as a like I said, as a positioning lug that goes on the anvil and that lug right there catches it to spin. Even as a professional smith, I would have never, I would have never guessed that's what those were for. All right, hang on. Was that the same tool he was using to measure a man to go with? All right, so, you know, guys, we're familiar. We're familiar with, like, the one-space bending fork. I've never seen one with a bunch of pieces like that. I, I don't know what the particular use would be, but I mean, that's a bending fork, I think. Or it's actually a measuring tool, or it's both. It's not the same one, because the other one actually had stuff on the back. 
yeah, the measuring gauge was double sided, but maybe those spaces are different sizes. But I mean, clearly the damn thing works. But you know that tin has a relatively low melting point. Work of the blacksmith. Je sais la forgeron. All right, that's another that's another gauge. That fellow's wiry. <laughs> no, the tin would most likely be used to keep it from sticking to the mandrel, or it's being used as some type of base. All right, whoa, 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 we got to back this up. All right, bang, bang. You got to see this one more time. Damn it, where, where'd it go? All right, what I'm looking at is you see the mandrel that the guy on the right is putting is is putting in there, Okay. What what they've done though is this almost looks like a hold fast. So when it sticks, and inevitably it's going to stick, you can actually knock this out without trying to pull it. Because you're not if it if it hangs, there's no way you're just pulling it straight out. So by having this little arm on there, the hammer can actually knock it out. Clear and scale out of the grooves. They are really not liking this cameraman. <laughs> they are very nervous about this cameraman. Again, using that little hook instead of hammering it, just pulling it out over the anvil. So now one of the things you need to look at, you know, these, these grooves, and this is clearly a different, a, a different anvil. This is almost, this is almost like you know, this is almost like a swage block uh, with these pieces cut in. And these are most likely a progressively smaller diameter as they, they go down the barrel. So that's why they're, they're steady moving along and up that progression. Mr. Wayne, Mr. Bill, welcome to the party. <laughs> hey, Mark, it's, the reason they're probably nervous is most likely an English cameraman. Wow. Hey, 410. Welcome in, man. 
All right, couple things. Uh, again, just for just for the sake of understanding how somebody works. Now he's having to lean over just a little bit, but look at these guys again. Very straight postures. Okay. Now, the other thing that I don't know if you guys have noticed is big boy right here. What, look at his left hand and look how he is hammering. Let me back that up. Watch his left hand. Look at his arm. It's not bending. He is using his left hand against his thigh. He's got that hammer head pulled in or the hammer handle pulled in against the thigh and he's using the hammer he's as a pivot point because you're again, you know, the, the, the point of these blows is not to super crush it. It's to get everything mushed and fused together. So to control that power on there, he still wants that mass, but he locks it in and now he has, every time he hits that metal, it's at the same angle. Now that's real important. If you're trying to get a smooth finish, if you swing a hammer, everything's moving. If you have a pivot point, man, that helps you so much get a consistent hammer strike. All right, I, I never even saw that and clearly this is a terribly important tool. It looks like that it's a piece of steel this had a an area, it may be split. It looks like steel. It's not burning, it's not smoking. It's gotta be steel. It's gotta be steel. And what he is doing is using that to shave off oxidation, scale, and probably if there's yeah, probably just scale. But look what a massive hunk. Maybe it's stone. That's a weird looking piece of stone, but whatever it is, it looks like iron. That's a big bar of iron that's been slit and then this clearly has been worked into it. There's another one of our measuring tools. One of the other amazing things is like in almost all these videos, they're smoking a pipe. At this point, notice that the metal seems to be fairly cool. Now, this is one other thing. If you'll notice um, our secondary guy here, the way that they're actually working the bellows, in Europe, a lot of the bellows were mounted in the ceiling. Uh, there's a lot of uh, woodcuts from the Diderot Encyclopedia that shows them in the ceiling. And so all this stuff was managed by cords. Uh, here in the U.S., a lot of the pieces I've ever seen have, have always, there's always been some type of stick situation, especially when there was like an outdoor forge or whatnot. But you always see this weird pulley system because what they would do is they would actually have to like run the cable in a weird way. So it wouldn't just be to the back of the forge. It would go up, turn left, come right, and just to wherever it could uh, so that they could get where the guy could stand because he hasn't moved. That's the other thing. This guy is operating the bellows and doing all the work for the primary and he's never moved. So he's working the bellows, working the hammer, and if you notice, he's never moved from his frame in the camera. We got some potato pixelation there. Mandrel goes in again, and now the, now now he's really putting some oomph to it.
Okay, did you notice that? Did you see how the helper what had, he's got the mandrel that's going to be inserted into there. But watch what he does. Hang on, that's not, right there. So when he's got it, he actually raises it up so the, so the uh, primary there can actually get it on top, get it on there very quickly just by holding it down just a little bit, pointing the tip of it up. And if you've noticed that this entire time we've been watching this, not a single miss strike. All right, hang on, guys. Like I said, we're uh, sure did. All right, hang on. Let's see. I think we're back here. We are back connected. Sorry about that, guys. Again, the internet's been acting all uh, still creepy. I mean, all day it's been wild. It just completely dropped connection there. All right, everybody, sound off. We back. We good. I see a little bit coming through. I got connection back on here. So like I said, it's catching up. All right, fantastic. Yep, 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 yep. Sorry about that, fellas. Again, don't know what's going on. <laughs> nope, we're about halfway into our video here. Uh, anyway, good again. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> One of the things I want you to notice that, that our primary here, a, a lot of what he's doing is actually, because remember, this ribbon has been wrapped down the mandrel. So the forge welding isn't going like this. This isn't like doing a stack for a knife billet. Where it's wrapped, the actual forge welding is occurring this way. It's occurring horizontally, not vertically. So when they're hammering it and it actually expands, that's helping the weld. But really and truly what's seeding it is when our primary takes that piece and he's actually cramming it against the swage block and doing this upsetting. That's what's actually really making the welds. All right, that was a top fuller. All right, hang on. I got to go back and watch this again. All right, so he's going to make the foundry mark, but that's a top set. That's not a that's not the top mark, but he's he's got to be right here. Hang on. What is he doing? All right, that little guy right there. That little bitty piece I have no idea. He didn't leave it there. He moved it. What in the hell? What in the hell, damn guy? The only thing, you know what, I will bet that what our secondary has, that's actually a measuring stick. It is probably giving our primary the proper measurement to, to go over here with this other hammer. Now, the thing is, is that tool that he's got is a top tool that seems to be matched to the bottom of the swage. But unless there's actually a maker's mark in that top tool, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know. Maybe that's it. Maybe that was a double strike in the same place. That it had to be maybe a measuring stick. All 
Again, ramming it against the swage. And these are relatively light blows. Again, notice the guy using the pivot with his left hand. Is that a bayonet he's using to scrape all flux? That is, in fact, a French bayonet. Looks like it's a broken bayonet, but that is a French bayonet that he's using to scrape off uh, slag and flux. Actually, it looks... I don't know which one that is. Again, very light blows, control blows. How about that? Wow. He's wearing a bracer on this arm. Again, look at the look at the super crappy quality of the handles on the tools. That looks like the Joker's broke. Look at this poor guy. He's like looking everywhere but the camera. Look, it's our grinding stones from the other video. Now, take take four moments. Let it soak in for a second. That I've, now clearly this photograph was staged. Think how many guns you would need to grind. How many barrels you would need to grind to need all those stones. <laughs> he's sitting next to an eight foot grinding stone. He's got his one little file. <laughs> Etched with sulfuric acid. No, this is this is nineteen twenty five. This is pre World War Two. This is this is a few years after the end of World War One. Oh, what's that? It's just nothing. Just a little bit of sulfuric acid. Just let me let me pour this on here, and I'll be damned. And he is wearing. <laughs> I don't I don't know if this qualifies as an early steel toe boot. This is more of an oak toe boot. He's wearing clogs. See, in in the U.S., the only way that I knew about clogs is is the Dutch, right? Because we had songs when we were kids. I am a pretty little Dutch boy, and all the girls love me, me, me. And we knew that they wore wooden shoes, but I'd never seen clogs uh, in France. <laughs> wow. That is a big-ass barrel. Look at how big that thing. That is, my God. That's got to be for, that's, yeah. Well, you know, I said shotgun barrel, but whew, that's a, and also this is octagon. And that is a huge barrel. Man, that's got to be like a four gauge shotgun if it's a shotgun.
Now, the crazy thing about this is, you know, one flaw, one flaw in the weld, and boom. Whoa. All right, now that was, this is unexpected. I've, you know, in the, in the 80s, there were a lot of the knife makers that were just getting into powdered metal stuff, things of that nature. Um, and I've, I've, never, I've never seen prior to the 80s this type of like name in there. I mean, this has to be, holy crap. Holy crap. I don't know, I don't know how they did that. So uh, I, I'm still trying. I'm still trying to wrap my my skull around how they because I'm familiar with how that the, how they often make. I mean this. So the pattern's twisted, right? Like the pattern is like twisted. I have I have no idea how this occurred. If those are twisted rods and the rods are hammered into a strip, all right, I'm I'm drawing to blank, fellas. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm really drawing to blank here. I mean, again, I know how to do this in powdered metal, which is something that Steve Schwartzer came up with, but I am, yeah, I'm a little, I am confused. Clearly, they did it. But how they did it, and considering that those rods were all twisted, right? And then the rods, three rods, were put together. And so it's constantly rotating. But all of these letters are like face up. All right, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna have to call in some, some heavier guns than, than th that's... All right. Yep. C consider Trent dumbfounded because I, I've never seen that type done this early. Didn't even knew, didn't even know the technique existed at this point. All right, we're gonna go. We're gonna go ahead here. I'm still. That's insane. Yeah, aliens. There is Monsieur Dupont. Look at this barrel for no reason. <laughs> All right. I've got, we're going back here. Like I said, normally I'd wrap things up, but I got to... No, no, I want to go back and look at this damn pattern. Because there's the star pattern. Hang on, where is it at? All right, come on. So there's several different flavors here, but again, all right. If if that is one of the initial rods, that means that that whole damn thing right there is three eighths of an inch. That can't be right. It's got to be right. It's 
got to be right. That's got, I mean, okay. <laughs> All right, but, but David, you're, you're not getting it. The, the pattern, the pattern here is on the end grain, okay? The name is on the flat. So how do you, I mean, you have had to have, again, if you did it in powder, You'd like, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on how this happened. I'm, I'm going to have to call Mr. Steve. Because this has got to be one of the individual rods. Right? I mean, this, I mean, this is it. But I mean, look how tiny. If that rod is even a half inch... That means that those little pieces there have got to be a sixteenth of an inch. If that, that's not, that, no, that'd be an eighth. That'd be a quarter. These would actually be smaller than a sixteenth of an inch. That's almost like wire, and it's clearly showing square. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I don't. I don't think we can rule out witchcraft on this one. I mean, I, I'm. I really am drawing a blank on this. I'm gonna have to call. I'm gonna have to call Mr. Steve on this one. So, yeah. Anyway, um, how damn incredible! Well, David, that probably there. But again, my problem is how in the hell did they get the name in there? <laughs> that's that's the deal. I mean, I understand that they had a separate bar that had the name facing out, but how did they get the repeating name in there? That's that's because it's over the whole barrel. It's literally over the whole barrel. And that clear and the other thing is No, it's not. That's no, that's there's an individual rod that is an individual rod from here to here. So you've got one rod on this side that's got part of the name, and then there's a second rod that's got the other part of the name on the opposite side, so when they're welded, they're touching together. Hmm. Again, I mean, this tech. There's a modern technique for this, but not a traditional one. Well, clearly there is. All right. So anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna drive myself crazy here. I'm gonna have to call in bigger guns. But, but, so guys, a couple of the takeaways from this. One, obviously, you talk about techniques that are you know beyond even a lot of us that are, um, you know, in the know. No, nope, it's not in the faker's mark. All right, like I said, I'm gonna, I'll think I'll never I'll never get done with the video if I sit here and thinking about it. So, couple of different couple of different takeaways. So, one, notice the continuity of these guys working together. Uh, not one missed strike, and these guys are going out, you know, just hard at it. Um, pivoting blows from hammers, two very distinct blows. Now, in everything else that we watched. We've seen the guys really wailing away on there. Again, you don't see the like the giant axe wings, but again, much heavier blows. Uh, with this, super refined. And you would think, you know, and guys, you always hear talk about anything that's over a half inch thickness is sledge work. You look at this barrel and you see that that guy had a at least a five or six pound sledge working this guy, unless he was just a tiny, tiny French dude. So, again, pay attention to the tools that they were using and the speed at which they were using them. Now, of course, I know that the film kind of sped, probably sped up the action a little bit. But still, these boys were moving. Notice their posture and the complete comfort with what they're doing. There was not a slip in any there. I mean, again, there's so much going on. And again, just like the other videos, these guys are packed together in a tiny space. And it's like a symphony. I, I call back toward the the uh, anchor video um, that 
again, you've got like 10 dudes hammering on the same piece. And like if you watch where they're striking, it, it, it looks like a strobe-like effect. There's always a hammer there, but it's a different hammer in every flash. Um, just the... And these guys are doing it in wooden shoes. By the way, I want to explain that they're not in boots, they're not in tennis shoes, that these dudes are literally doing this in wooden shoes. Um, and I, I still... And I thought about this the other day just when I was looking at... You know, when I was thinking about these videos, how different how almost foreign it is to even my time in Andersonville. Jay, uh, Jay wasn't a, a, you know, he wasn't a trained blacksmith. He he picked it up and kind of learned from scratch, took a few classes and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, you guys are definitely late to the party. Uh, but, you know, just to see how these guys move and interact. I mean, they were packed in getting stuff getting stuff going. I mean, and to come out with something like this. I just, I mean, again, I'm dumbfounded on that end. But, well, guys, you missed out. Like I said, we, uh, again, I apologize. We're going to try to have some uh, Friday at 1 o'clock. I'm going to try to make that as sacred as I can. Uh, I know I talked about it a little bit earlier. Like I said, hopefully I'm going to be getting some new scheduling type stuff going down. It's not going well. I will have another video out uh, on the channel here shortly, kind of explaining everything that's going on. Uh, again, I'm having some artist brain issues because I am really wanting to get into... Uh, I've been trying to be scheduled and measured in what I filmed. It's just not working. The artist brain says either film everything you can or just sleep. And um, trying to slow it down has really led to not as many videos getting out, uh, not as much enthusiasm in those videos. So we're going to be end up doing some tweaking. But again, that's that's another message for another time. Having said that, guys, thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed the video, as always, please uh, do the like, subscribe thing. Uh, if you're interested in buying a book, you can go to trentontide.com. Uh, we're going to start, like I said, with the classes we've been teaching the weekends have been awesome. Very shortly, we should have some schedules up for that. And of course, of course, the biggest thing for these live streams, guys, what funds these live streams are your donations. So you can either go over to Patreon and become a Patreon or check the link in the description uh, where you can make a direct donation. A couple of dollars from a several people makes a difference and makes these things possible. So, guys, thank you very, very much for being here. You guys be safe, and I will catch you folks a little later.